Hey guys, it's your host Julian. This week is a special one, full of laughs and walking down memory lane while we're talking Courage the Cowardly Dog with storyboard artist Pilar Noon. I want to give a special shout out to all the patrons that help support this podcast. Bill, Brent, Brittany, A-Legged Bird, and Jacob. Thank you all so much for your support. It truly means a lot. If you want to become a member of our Patreon channel to help support the podcast and get all these eps early and ad-free, follow the link below and sign up today. Now, let's get to my chat with Pilar. First off, man, how do you get on Courage the Cowardly Dog? You know, I, um, so John Dilworth is, um, was, and I still consider him to be my mentor, um, because I came on as, I basically just called him up out of the blue and was just like, can I, um, work for you? And he says, how would you like to, you know, come on as an intern? And I was like, sure, I'll do anything. Like the break into animation is amazing. So he was in like a tiny studio. And um, he was working on a CD-ROM at the time. Mm. And all you kids out there, if you remember, a lot, of, a lot of you probably don't even know what a CD-ROM is, but it's like an iPad app, but on a CD that you put into a desktop computer. But yeah, yes, uh-huh, <laughs> one of those. So, um, and some of them are animated. So mm -hmm. I worked on, um, you know, I was, I was, I did in-betweens for him and he taught me so much and after two weeks, he said, noodle. He calls everyone noodle. He did back then. <laughs> he said, um, you're a freelancer now. I'm paying you. I'm like, awesome. He's like, now get out of here and come back first thing in the morning. Yeah. You know, we always had this like, this like drill sergeant relationship. Like, okay, get to work. <laughs> He's so fun. I love him so much. So then, um, and then we worked on some stuff like um, he got in some shirt and, uh, and uh, some of you out there might have heard of Noodles and Ned for, mm -hmm. on Sesame Street. And um, he started working on those and I was working on those, uh, both doing in-betweens, cleanup, and eventually I was doing like assistant animation and it was really fun. And then this little show got picked up based on a short that he did that got nominated for an Oscar, a Courage the Cowardly Dog and a Chicken from Outer Space, which is so cool. And uh, this little short, <laughs> Courage the Cowardly Dog and a Chicken from Outer Space, uh, turned into a little project known as the Courage the Cowardly Dog Show. And um, and um, it was really cool because I was still very inexperienced. And at first, John asked me like, what department? I had like, like what I, I didn't exactly have like first dibs it was commensurate on my experience but he was like what department would you like to be in and, and I was like you know whatever your, your department you'll have me and uh, so I ended up in like prop design which is so cool and that, well anyway that was a really long way of answering your question and and then the rest is history <laughs> oh I like a long ways to answer questions man because we when we buy DVDs or, or, or folks that buy DVDs like myself, I like watching it for the bonus features. I like watching it when it's the commentary with folks like yourself or, you know, the character designers or the board artists or even the creators. They get to tell these little stories that aren't really known. You know, we can Google almost anything about it. You can watch any episode. You can listen to any soundtrack. But very, very far and few between do you get to hear stories about what it was like working with John, with David, with Jody, with all the board artists, with all the revisionists, with the character designers, with the prop designers, you know what I mean? So getting to go in and watch the voice actors do their magic, you know, we don't get to really see too much of that. And if we do, it's little 10 second, 13, 14, 50, 30 seconds, whatever it might be, you know, little interstitials in here, you know, so getting to hear those stories like that from you or, or something that a lot of us fans want to hear because it's like we fiend for this stuff. We loved these cartoons growing up. Like I told you before we record, it shaped and molded a lot of us, right? So anytime we get to hear any behind the scenes stories, man, we, we absolutely love it and we eat it up. Um, you know, circling back to something that I wish I would have asked Jody, I know I'm going to ask uh, um, Dilly when he comes on down the road, but out of all the shorts that were on for that, what a cartoon, cartoon, cartoon um, that went to series like Courage. Why do you think, in your personal opinion, that that was the one that got picked up and nominated for an Oscar out of all of them? What was so special you know, about that one to you? 
it was uh, and it was really interesting because I saw that short before I even met John mm-hmm. and and John you know it um even though interestingly it was done for what a cartoon which was for cartoon network what mm-hmm. a cartoon, cartoon yeah sorry brain still asleep uh <laughs> teaching each brain cells um and interestingly it was done as a short for cartoon network which is television but it was also still like considered like uh an independent short which is what made it mm-hmm. qualify as an oscar you know which is really cool i didn't like to this day that still blows my mind yeah. that it was a short that was for television for cartoon network but it's also an independent film short the end which is amazing and john and I'm not putting down anyone else's approach. Mm-hmm. I'm just going from what I know about John as he approached it like an independent animator, not like a television show. Yeah. And um and approached it very cinematically and and you have, you know, there's just something just so appealing about it that made it not only work great as an independent film that got nominated for Oscar, but also compelling enough for people to want to say, Hey, I want to go into that world, you know? Absolutely. So Absolutely. It's really like, yeah. Really cool. <laughs> that would, uh, you know, when David was on a couple years back, he, he said when he was working on it, he would dream in that color palette that John selected for courage. You know, he would have both dreams and nightmares, um, you know, in the, in the colors of courage. Did you ever, you ever go through your day and like, oh man, I'm looking at the the courage palette and I'm kind of bringing the courage palette home with me. Did you ever go through something like that? What David was talking about? You know, I would actually go through like all of my characters, like started looking like that style. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like all of my characters started looking like I was, I came across an old storyboard of mine for a film idea I have that I still want to do. And and I was looking at it, all of my characters had this, had skinny, long, skinny legs and big eyes. I was like drawing in the stretch style without even meaning to. <laughs> he had, he had the style and he had an influence for sure. And and that was one of the ones that I, I remember even going back and watching it before we, uh, before we started chatting, you know, I go back and I, I just did a, a two-parter with a, with a buddy that also hosts a po- animation podcast. And we did What a Cartoon. So we broke down, uh, obviously, the big five, six, and then all of the ones that didn't make it to series that we thought should have made it to series and all the ones that we absolutely love that don't get right, picked up. some of them didn't. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, yeah, there was a bunch of them there that I was like, oh, man, this one should have went to series for sure. And when you watch the Courage pilot and you watch the other pilots, it looks like John had, even though they all got the same amount of money to to produce all of these whatever have you seen godzilla minus one and i'm gonna draw a correlation to this real quick you don't no, not yet it is but i need to but it is phenomenal and i think I, they I only love have godzilla 20... content so I, i'm sleeping on it i'm sleeping on it. i gotta get it's it. on it's on netflix it might be the greatest godzilla movie i've ever seen in my life and i've seen them all um okay okay with okay, that with notes. that being said 20 million dollars or 30 million dollars is one of those two is all they spent on the cgi for this movie and you couldn't tell it, it looked like a $300 million movie when you look at the CGI wow. for Godzilla for everything. Now, with that being said, the reason I draw that correlation, it was like you see everybody short and this is not a slight and knock against anybody. But it looked like John did what Godzilla minus one did 30 years later. He maximized every single penny and every single cent. He squeezed everything he could out of everything to get this beautiful visualization. Um, that's what I remember. It. I remember it being different, not because it was just the colors or the characters or things were stretched like you had said in his style. It was just visually stunning. It was visually separate from everything else. I mean, it was mind blowing. Even today, 30 years later, even today, it's mind blowing watching that pilot. Oh, I, I, I love it. And it's like also like it was like sort of sort of like compelling, like. Like the chicken, uh, we don't even know what the chicken was going to do with Muriel. Was he going to kill her? Was he going to bring her back to his planet? You know what I mean? Yeah. And we never got to find out because he got shot with a ray gun or something. <laughs> <laughs> he got turned into oh, a uh, to a roasted chick. Yeah, yeah, spoiler alert. Ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't seen this in 30 years and you're watching the Curse Cowboy Dog episode <laughs> of the show, shame on you. But uh, yeah, he gets turned into a roasted chicken. Now, with that being said, 
Uh, there was three episodes uh, that in particular that you brought up. We kind of buried the lead at the beginning of that one. And I sent myself some uh, some notes here because I rewatched these uh, over the last couple of days. Um, let's start out with King Ramsey's episode. This one was still haunting, that voice. But the 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 sassiness that King Ramsey's had when he was dealing with Eustace, I thought was hilarious. You know, So he would return to slab, return to slab. Eustace would yell, what's your offer? You know, and then he would get thwarted by court courage at every at every event. Right. And then he would just be like he'd put his hand on his hip, King Ramses, and he'd be like, oh, come on. I love the sassiness of this Egyptian king. How does this episode come about? How do you get to work on this episode? How does this one uh, flush over to Pilar? Well, by the time I got I um got it, and that was actually one of the first episodes I worked on. Um uh, it was actually um I did uh, a lot of, so I was a storyboard revision artist on that episode. Mm -hmm. And um I worked on season one and I'm I'm actually in the credits twice because I was a prop designer and a storyboard revisionist. Um because halfway through the season, the storyboard art supervisor Bob Miller decided that he wanted he said hey i like how you work and he basically poached me and brought me over to the <laughs> uh storyboard so i got to see both sides of it but by the time i got it i got a, a storyboard like a section of storyboard that was very like roughly drawn and we were the last line of defense before it got sent over overseas to get animated so storyboards had to be like like clean I... so yeah. clean because there couldn't even be one dot out of place or one line out of place because I've, I've gotten notes back for like, he has two dots on one side of his nose and one dot on the other side. I've gotten notes back Shit. that he has this, the wrong number of dots on one side. I've got I the forgot wrong which side, dots. but he has on one side, he has two dots and one whisker and he has one dot and two whiskers. Like, and I've gotten notes back, like, you know, like, Oh, it's on the wrong side. Cause sometimes you would get it like flopped. <laughs> you know um so i would get like a rough storyboard or sometimes i would even get a section of script uh because the storyboard was storyboarded out of house and then it was sent to me um us like there's a few of us and um you know and then i had to then um even add more poses and though i remember there was actually we had to do a lot of the plagues a lot of like the is it 10 plagues yeah. or 12? Oh my God. I think it's like just three. It was the locust. It was the water. And then it was the, uh, uh, what is that shit called? The record player with the shitty music. Yeah. And what's that was, um, I don't know if I'm right. <laughs> I seem to remember that it was originally going to be the best of John Tesh. And so Cartoon Network, like they love like, you know, they would rein us in with the beauty of like being, working on season one is they weren't like reining us in as much. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, David and John, it's like might beg to differ, but like, I kind of felt like season one, we were trying stuff out where we were setting the tone for the rest of the season. Maybe mm -hmm. I'm biased because that's the season I worked on. <laughs> but we had to be like, they said, okay, you have to have Plague of Locusts and, uh, and you know, what you said the other way. And Prince of Egypt had just come out. And we were like, quick, um, let's go to Barnes and Nobles and, and, and look in the, the making up book of the Prince of Egypt and reference <laughs> it. Because this was before Google, you know what I mean? Like, this was like, yeah. I mean, I I think something like Google existed. Like, you could Google stuff in like Jeeves. 1999. Yeah, it's yes. like Ask Jeeves. But you know, the algorithm killed Jeeves. Really? That was it. Yeah, the algorithm kills killed Jeeves and it was just ask.com after that. But Damn. I like that Butler RIP, Jeeves. So sad. Yeah, but um out for him. Yeah, right? But um <laughs> they they said, "Okay, uh quickly, we have to you know, and maybe it was part of it might have been like, oh, Prince of Egypt was just out, you know, we want to have some plagues." <laughs> yeah. And I couldn't just google like and now you just google something, you know. So we, so we just went, hold on a second. Alexa, lower volume. All right, she has a mind of her own. <laughs> so um, we went to um, the sto uh, store and found the Prince of Egypt book. I think I ended up just buying it and I still have it. And we were sketching. 
ah, me and like two other artists, ah, quick, Lucas, you know, so we're doing all these, all these like ex explorations of like Locus and, and it was, it was really, um, anyway, yeah, I don't know if I'm answering your question in any way, shape or form, but it was like, no two assignments was alike. Everything mm -hmm. you worked on was completely different, you know? But I just remember doing a lot of like lo scenes where he was running from the locust and he runs past the uh, chicken coop and the locust goes, Dzz. yeah. And, it, and then he runs past the van and, and it goes, the, the truck, I mean, it goes, Dzz. and there's just four tires left and it goes, dink, 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 dink. and the tires <laughs> fall over, one. but not even just all at once, they fall over one at a time. Yeah. And in storyboard, we were doing stuff with timing. Because you could just do like two drawings. Here's the truck, and now here's four tires left, and then here's a third drawing with boink, the tires falling. But no, you it was sort of like, how does the truck get eaten? And that would involve like, like, like on storyboard, like three, you know, every phase of how the truck gets eaten. How do the tires fall? Do they fall all at once or are they staggered? Well, they're staggered. So one panel, two panel, two. So you were. By the time the animators got this, they knew exactly how to space it out, you know. Were you guys sending over to Korea at that time? Oh man, that's like I've been telling people Thailand, and I'm probably completely wrong. I am the wrong person to ask about that. <laughs> I oh. used to know. Uh, I believe it was either Thailand or Korea. Okay, the only reason I ask is because uh, you're, you're the the second person that's worked in storyboards uh, in the last couple of weeks that has said that like we had to have everything perfect. There was no room for interpretation. Was it just because of the the language barrier for you guys, or was it the fact that you were sending it over to a different country that you wanted to make sure that hey, you did this panel for panel how we wanted it? Well, because it wasn't like because uh, I worked on Daria uh, for MTV and I love um, that show. Oh, uh, that was fun and um. I worked on uh, layout and layout was done in house. Like storyboard was sent over to layout and we didn't need pretty much didn't need storyboard revisionists over there because the storyboards got turned into layouts in house and all the corrections, putting stuff on model, doing posing was done by the layout team. And then it was sent overseas with, with courage. There wasn't a layout department. We were it. And then they created layouts from our storyboards. Gotcha. So then it, it basically what they had to do is just take the storyboard panel that's this big and increase the size to nine field. And uh, where is it? 12, it's 12 field was wrong. To 12 field. I'm thinking about paper. And uh, then work directly off the boards. If they're not able to work directly off the boards, we didn't do our job right. Got you. Yeah, uh, yeah it is, it's it's always fascinating to hear, like, especially when you're going to a different country, you want to make sure, because back then it wasn't like something you could email, get it back like that. It was like you had to wait at the very least a few days and you're getting back like, oh, shit, I've heard so many stories where like they did it absolutely wrong. So now I have, we're in a crunch time. This episode is due in three weeks. We got to do this, redo this and send it back and hope. So it's always fun hearing like how that all worked, you know, which which parts of the country you guys had to start, send it to. Um, you know, with that being said, I'm just reading over my notes here for the uh, the, yeah. the King Ramses. Um, one thing that stuck out, it stuck out in Courage more than any other show, especially during this era, was the, the duality, I guess, but not even the duality, I don't think that's the right word, but the fact that you would use traditional animation and then you would still see CGI in 3D styled characters and their King Ramses being one. I saw it more so in the backgrounds, uh, I, which I absolutely loved. I love seeing traditional animation. And then it was like a, almost like a screensaver, old school screensaver. Um, you'd have those blue skies with the white clouds and everything going by. And, and I, I thought it was such a cool aesthetic. It was like it didn't look like it went together, but it looked like it felt like it went together, if that made sense. Like it was perfect. You know, where was, where did the obvious that came from John, but like, what was that? Was that a conscious effort to go like, Hey, we want to kind of mix media this a little bit, or how, how, how does that flush out? Yeah. And no, I thought that was really cool. I wasn't a part of that, hmm. but like, uh, we just had like just an amazing team. You had like amazing people, like the amazing Margaret Fry, uh, people like the amazing, uh, William Hohauser, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but with, with me, like, I, I just love the aesthetics because it was just like, 
and I wasn't uh, a part of the coloring uh, side, so I'm a little hesitant to talk about it just because I don't want to give you the wrong information. Oh, I but, got you. I got you. Um, but just this was like the beginning of seeing something like like different elements being brought together with Photoshop. Mm -hmm. That was like the first time I'd ever seen that. It yeah. wasn't just like backgrounds drawn and inked and then colored with cell shading. Like it was colored with textures. And I had never seen that before. Like, like the inside of the house, the rug, like the floor was mm -hmm. it, like, like the, the floor was actually like a photograph. The texture that filled it was actually a photograph of a, really? of a rug, you know, like, of a patterned rug and there was a wood pattern, you know what I mean? It was really cool. So it wasn't, and I learned a lot. Like I, to this day, I wish I can get something like that because whenever I attempt to uh, color, it just always, to me, like always looks very like forced. Hold on a second. Mm -hmm. Alexa, lower volume. <laughs> uh, my husband's in the other room, uh, listen to reggae. And for some reason, the Spotify went through the, uh, and interestingly enough, it's a track that he's playing drums on. He he's awesome. <laughs> Talk <Yeah>. about <laughs> Give him a shout out. What's his name? His name is Ivo Nine. Ivan Ivo Nine Cats, and that's his oh. stage name because there's a drum machine called the Nine O Nine. Uh huh. But he became known as the Ivo Nine because he keeps time so well. Like, he's really amazing. Like he's played with, he's played with people like google when you get a chance he's played with people like going all the way back classic hip-hop and stuff but yeah. when you get a chance later google easy star all stars and they Ooh. they're famous for doing a reggae version of dark side of the moon Ooh. called dub side of the moon and uh they're like really popular so he's he's in that band like he basically is one of the originators of that band that's really cool i'm a real big fan of hip-hop and uh r&b especially when it comes to late eighties, early nineties, uh, and anything right now. Um, oh, so thank you for that. I got that written down. Shout out to your oh, husband. Definitely. Um, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah. So King Ramses, uh, some of the things that, that stuck out in this episode, um, were all of the, the gags that would go on with this, obviously the locusts. I loved the, I'm, I'm glad you brought the four tires up. Cause I actually wrote that down. I loved how they didn't all fall down at once. I thought that yeah. made it a little bit more comical. It was like the rules of three, but the rules of four, since there was four tires. Um, yeah, yeah. My favorite moment, and I don't, I don't know why. I just thought it was so silly. Was when the the house floods. Everybody's in the attic, right? Mural's trying to get out. Courage is trying to get out. And Eustace is down with a snorkel, holding the slab. And the snorkel is completely submerged underwater. So he would have drowned, essentially. You see that scene, and it's a very quick cutaway scene. And, and I, I'm laughing hard. I think it was because the edibles were kicking in at that time. So I was really <laughs> laughing. I was really into it. And then you just see him. And then Courage swims downstairs and pulls a plug in the basement. And that's how all of the water gets out. And that's when you see King Ramsey's put his hand on his hip. He's like, oh, come on, right? Um, so I love the little gags in, in this episode. I, I was worked on that storyboard. Did you? That that's that, that was... scene when he swims through. I I actually uh, worked work on worked on that scene. I'm I'm so glad you worked on this scene because, like I said, it's my favorite scene in the entire in the entire episode. That whole part. What was your favorite? Obviously, you worked on that scene, but what was your favorite scene? It doesn't have to be the one you worked on. It might have been something else. But does one or two stick out to you as far as favorite scenes? For King Ramses, yeah, probably um that one. That one was really cool because he was swimming through the house. And then I got to use both my storyboard and my prop design chops because he was swimming through the house, but then there were chairs floating. Yeah. And and they were changing position. And as he was swimming through them and under them, and uh, th those were uh, props that also had to be designed, you know? And that was like a fun episode. Yeah. And then, oh, then it was also like the... um. Oh, yeah, like I was starting to tell you, the record player, when he smashes the record player. <laughs> the funny thing is, is, um, oh, yeah, I started to say it was originally supposed to be like the best of John Tesh. Mm -hmm. But Cartoon Network said, OK, you can't do that. Like, so they they reigned us, you know, I wasn't one of the writers, but I, I laughed. It was like really funny. And I still am not at all familiar with John Tesh's music. 
And this, <laughs> so it was just like a generic, like best of, I can't even remember if you, I really need to go back and like rewatch some of these, you know, but I thought that was really fun. <laughs> they, all of these, all of these episodes hold up. This show holds up considerably. Um, I mean, I've had you know, like people I said, come up to me and like start sobbing when I tell them I work on it. And I'm like, I'm like, uh, what is wrong with you? <laughs> like grown men have got, and I, I was just like, what? Wait, wait, you okay? And then they're like, yes, oh my God, you worked on this show. I can't believe I'm meeting him. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm but one of many that worked on the show. And it was so long ago. Why are you still impressed by this? <laughs> I know you're, I know you're really busy, but did you get a chance to listen to the episode I did with David a couple years back? No, oh God, no, I'm gonna listen to everything. So sorry, like the last the <laughs> oh, last no, couple you're... of the last basically um and it's really interesting how we met. I'm going all over the place, but um we still talk a little bit about how we met and how my Twitter went viral all of a sudden, but we'll get to that in a second. But it had to do with Courage Cowardly Dog, actually. Oh, I, this is this is the same thing because I love hearing stories about uh, folks like yourself meeting fans, getting to meet folks like us, right? Because I'm pretty sure you you would geek out like if uh, I don't know who your who your idol is, but say Tex Avery walks by or Chuck Jones, somebody along that fact, you're like, oh my god, that's fucking Tex Avery. Oh my god, that's fucking Chuck Jones, right? So we look at you guys the same way because you guys helped, like I said, mold us. You helped. We sat in front of a TV and we learned morals and we learned ethics. By a little fucking dog that used Google before Google, right? You know, so there's a lot of the whole thing. Yes, when he had the computer. Know like... about that shit. Yeah. And he was a sassy computer. Would tell him he was dumb without really yeah. telling him he was dumb. Well, in the episode when um the crushing foot, like the one where they turn into yes. and um I, so I did disgusting. a lot of work on that episode. He said, and he says, um, and he says, um, how do you get rid of wait, wait, he said, How do you get rid of bad foot fungus? And the um and the computer says, "Oh, dog saliva." And he's like, "Dog saliva." He says, "Work up a good drool, baby." And then he, and it was like the only thing that gets rid of the 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 what was it called the, the fungus, foot fungus the foot fungus yeah was was dog saliva. So great! <laughs> that episode is one of those ones that stick in my head. Is just like it makes me like, I don't know what it is like seeing somebody's discuss like we live in Florida. So flip flops are a thing. Um, just seeing some of the, the dirty, dirtiest feet I've ever seen wearing flip flops. Like you see stuff like that uh, athletes. Like, oh, just disgusting. So that episode has a different connotation. It makes me like shiver <laughs> for a different reason. But uh, the, the, the reason I brought up David was because he told me this, uh, this story about meeting fans but not realizing they were fans. I think he said he was walking by and he saw these kids that were like teenagers. Maybe they were like 16, 17, but they were smoking cigarettes. And he goes up to him and he's like, don't you know smoking's bad? And David, I'm sorry if I'm paraphrasing this and there was more to the story, but this is what I remember from two years ago. He's like, don't you know smoking was bad? And I can't remember if he said he, he saw somebody wearing a Courage the Cowardly Dog shirt, but he's like, I worked on that show. Listen to me, take it from me. I know what I'm talking about. Don't smoke cigarettes, it's bad for you. And he just walks away from these teenagers. So he was like, oh, my God, these guy, that guy worked on Curse the Cowardly Dog. So it's always fun hearing the fan interactions with how you guys meet and your fan probably base. probably changed their lives. Who knows? Yeah, maybe. You, you know what um happened to me is that um like um for a while, like work kind of got a little dry for me, shall we say. And mm -hmm. um I started um teaching an after school animation after school programs. And I actually uh, got my sub license and started teaching substitute teaching in city schools. And um, that's basically like you're the complete bottom of the totem pole of the entire school. Mm -hmm. Like lower the air, like, but you just go in with a sense of humor and you're just like, whatever. And I started substitute teaching at LaGuardia High School for Performing Arts where I went over here. Uh, mm -hmm. Some may know it as the fame school. And, um, and the first thing I did, I called them and I, and I said, um, you know, I graduated here like 20 years, so years ago, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just like, this, this is Johnson. I remember you get in here. <laughs> so I go in, and I'm like, and my, a lot of my teachers are still there. And that's really funny when you're like in your, your late thirties and you meet your teachers, your whole demeanor changes to like, 
you start acting like you did when you were a kid. I don't know if I'm the only one that does this. Cause I'm just like, I'll be talking to people like, oh, um, yes, yes, yes. And, I, and then I'll see one of my teachers. Oh, what's up, Miss Dell? How you doing? And then I'll start <laughs> acting like, like, I'll slip into the vernacular of how I talk when I was 16. It's really bizarre. So um, I started um, teaching there and I was treated with a lot of appreciation by the staff and the teachers. Cause I went there. A lot of people I knew were still there. And I quickly became known as the teacher that worked on Courage the Cowardly Dog. Yeah. And I would have like, I would be walking down the hallway and like a group of five girls would run up to me and like, we think you're cool. <laughs> um, it, um, Hi, Mrs. Katz. Because I go by Mrs. Katz when I work with anyone under like college age. It's like, hi. Well, thank you. Okay, bye. So one day um, I was standing there and I... um. A girl led another girl over to me and she said, go on, Mrs. Katz, tell her what you worked on. I said, Courage to Carolee Dog. She says, okay, that's cool. Tell her the other one, Daria. And then the girl that she led over just like went, burst into tears. I said, what's wrong with her? Make her stop. And she said, she's never like met anyone that's worked on her childhood before. And I said, if I draw Daria for you, will you stop crying? She said, okay. I said, okay, good. And like, and another time, there was like a really tall, very, you know, like 17 year old teenager boy, like sitting there, like, oh, looking all tough, like, uh, can you draw my notebook? You know, trying to act like he doesn't care, but still, and like, can you draw my notebook? I said, sure. And then I doodled courage in his notebook. I don't even know if it was a very good doodle. And I wrote, nice to meet you and gave it to him. And then he was just like, I was like, oh my God. I and he goes, leave me alone, Mrs. Katz. Look away, look away. <laughs> and it was like, and I was like, I was like, oh, I'm so touching. He goes, ah, you're making it worse. Just go. <laughs> <laughs> so just seeing like, like a six foot tall, tough teenager, a guy especially, reduced to tears by a doodle that I did that like was this big and took 10 seconds to draw, like blew my mind. And at that time, I had taken Courage of Cowardly Dog off my resume. I was like, I was like, look, I worked on this show 20 years ago. No one cares anymore. And I took it off my resume. And this was during a time where I was feeling particularly, you know, kind of dark and studios had stopped hiring me. And and then I just dis I discovered like my calling. Like not only did I realize working with young people, teenagers who were the age the, the, to see the reruns of the show I worked on with this amazing team. And you get to see the effect it had on people. I put it back on my resume because I saw how much yeah. it meant to see people. And then I discovered my calling and that made me want to work with young people, which is why I teach and still do. <laughs> have you thought I don't about even doing... remember if I answered anything, huh? <laughs> oh, no, I, like I said, I love these stories. This is why this is called the What's In My Head podcast. It's what's so fun about podcasts because... You know, we we talked, we said we're going to talk Courage the Cowardly Dog, and that's what we're talking about. Whether we talk about, you know, the episodes that you put, we just talked about King Ramses is probably, in my opinion, is probably the most famous episode with the exception of the pilot. King Ramses is the one that everybody, everybody always brings up as being fucking terrified of seeing this haunting figure that moved differently, that talked differently than anything else that yeah. ever seen before. You know, when it came to the villains on Courage the Cowardly Dog, my favorite one was Bushwick. I do not like bugs i don't like roaches i don't like spiders they're fucking oh. disgusting i love bushwick i that's after my time was that season two i think so it was two or three he was just a big cockroach that had the switch blade that had that very new york yeah. style accent and body language he was that uh what are they well he was like a a, um, a fucking mafia styled character and it was just like he was from providence instead of new york they that's the vibe he was giving off right i think sopranos had already really started so he yeah. was like that sopranos-esque character and he was just so fun because he would you would just he it was the f cutaway scenes that they would do he would just be sitting in there in the chair and flicking a switchblade and then he would just like smack his teeth almost and then it would go to something else so he's a very very weird character but he was very very fun so those that's the villain i think of but it, it's just this this medium of podcasting is so fun because we talk courage but it doesn't have to be just on what you did that fan interaction story is fun i don't know when the last time you heard that story or somebody heard that story the first time you told that story so that might be something cool and everybody can relate to that time meeting somebody that whether it was a 
sports uh, an athlete uh, an author a musician you know an artist like yourself that they looked up to because like i said we got sat in front of a tv when we were very little and we got to see this little courageous yet scared pinkish purple dog work through some shit and you know when you're a little kid and you're watching things like this it's problem solving for us we see things whether it was conflict resolution with him and Eustace you know him showing and being shown love from Muriel you see him abandoned as a pup right saved by Muriel you know that yeah. whole fucking thing you see all of these things and it's it goes to say like you see somebody do something or you see something happen it makes you think oh that shit's possible i can do that i mean you're not going to battle a, an egyptian king that's looking for a slab that's not going to happen i hope <laughs> fingers crossed but you see little shit like that that you can put into your life so I, like i said these stories are fun to hear and podcasting is fun because of stories like that that you just shared because of stories that david shares so thank you for sharing those stories well sure but thanks for listening and and no thanks for like giving me a way to share and actually on my um a lot of people write to me on my Twitter now and uh, I've turned my Twitter into like a platform and a lot Good. of people say courage of Carolee dog means a lot to me because when I was a kid, it gave you permission. It's okay to be afraid. You can mm -hmm. be afraid, but still be brave. And that's, I think that's what John was. That's what makes him so relatable. It's okay to be afraid. You're not automatically called like, Ooh, you're a coward. It's like, mm -hmm. even though he's cowardly, he's still courageous because he always steps up and saves his family. Absolutely. You know, it's not, yeah. you do one bad thing. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. People aren't black or white. It's very great. Life is very gray. You can do something bad, but in the context, it could be for the positive. So you're not a bad person. You're doing what you think is necessary to be a good person, if that makes any sense. So it gave us those vibes. It gave us that, that morality. It helped us you know, like I said, problem solve at the very smallest level. Help us problem solve a lot of things. A lot of cartoons do that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. No, and, that was a fun show. And no two episodes were alike, in my opinion. <laughs> oh, man. Not, not, not unless they even even if they had reoccurring characters, which, you know, there's some episodes where they did, um, you know, I think it was, it was the sun from the chicken from outer space and Grant, whatever it was, they, they did a couple of those episodes where it was revisited, but even then it was different each time, you know, we're staying on this for just a second, uh, you know, with you finding an audience and having a platform on, on Twitter to talk about your time on courage. Um, have you thought about doing something, whether it was with Patreon, whether it was with YouTube, you know, something where you can walk them through storyboarding, you walk them through scenes. I've had so many artists that are on that do that. And that's like their, their sole profession now. That's what funds their their independent projects. That's what funds all the other extracurricular activities. Have you thought about that? I I thought about it, but um, um, basically I I teach. I full I'm full time. I'm program director of a department now, and it's um, it's hard. I don't know if I would have time to really maintain that. But the one thing I do. What happened with Twitter was when I started subbing. Mm -hmm. uh, when I started substitute teaching at LaGuardia High School. I was basically like just welcomed with open arms and treated like a member of the art department. And I was always brought in to cover art classes. Like yeah. they would occasionally need like a warm body to like come in and like, you know, we need someone to cover math or you know what I mean by warm body is like just someone like an adult in the room. And at the time I still looked like, if you saw me from sort of a distance, I still look like one of the, I still <laughs> look like a teenager. Maybe I got a few more grades, like even since then. But one time I was standing in front of like an English class and I saw somebody look in the, you know, look in the window and do one of those Mr. Furley takes like looking and, and, oh, and then like ran away. I was like, who's that? And I was like, oh, I don't care. And I'm like, anyway, hi, everyone. I'm Mrs. Katz and I have a handout. Uh, and then the phone rang in the classroom. So I'm like, excuse me a second. I ran over. And um, it was Mrs. Johnson from the desk. She said, I know that you were there, but somebody called the office and said, there's no teacher in that classroom. I looked in the window and all I see are students. And I said, all right. I th I said, nope, I'm here. And I said, I'll come down. I think I know exactly what happened. I started laughing. She said, okay. I said, after class, I'll close to you. As a class, I said, you know what happened? Somebody was walking down the hall, looked like another teacher. And she looked in and thought I was a student. And and it's really funny. So ever since then, and I always dress professionally. I always wear like a blazer and, but 
she uh, was the thought I was the student. So it's hilarious. And it happened to me a few times. Um, so anyway, one day I was like subbing for an art class and my, my dealio is, okay, uh, you know, Mrs. Katz, draw a courage Carly dog for us. And I said, in the last 10 minutes of class, I'll draw a courage Carly dog for you. If you do the work, <laughs> because they have a certain amount of work they have to get done. You know, I'm given a lesson plan and, you know, let's say they have to, you have to complete your painting and, and clean up. And so finally in the last 10 minutes of class, one of the students came up to me and said, okay, we all did our work. And I said, okay, you all cleaned up. Okay. I'll draw. So I, so I said, okay, I'll, I'll do a quick demo on how to draw courage. And I drew him on the blackboard and this one girl said, Hey, do, do you mind if I take a picture of you? I said, no, that's fine. And I, it was drawing courage to carry dog. A, and everybody was like, the whole class, everything like stopped. Everyone was like gathered around like, oh my God. A year later, my niece, who's a teenager at the time in California, wrote to me. And keep in mind, this was 10 years ago. And said, I'm Pilar, is this you? And she emails me this picture. It was from Reddit. It had 2 million views. And it was the picture Holy of the courage to carry dog on the blackboard. And I was like, what? That's crazy. And um, I was like, two million views, I should be rich by now. But <laughs> my name wasn't anywhere on it. So I was like, anyway, that's good. I don't want two million people to know who I am. But yeah. um, every now and then someone's able to extrapolate all the information. Hmm, I said, not many women worked on it. Who's the only one likely enough to have a weird name, Pilar? Hmm. And, they, and people are able to put two and two together and look in the credits. Mm -hmm. and, and it resurfaces every few months because whenever it resurfaces, I get a bump in the number of Instagram followers. So yeah. it's like, I get 50 extra followers. I'm like, all right, where is it now? And it's, and it showed up. There's an, there's a, a page called the, the life and death of Nickelodeon, mm -hmm. even though it's like, it's not Nickelodeon, but it's like all nineties cartoons are kind of lumped in. And then there's another one called like Nickelodeon cartoons, another one like called black animators. And I get like, and it's it just keeps bouncing back and forth and resurfacing on Reddit. Um, but one day this um this really cool uh, uh insta uh called horror for kids mm -hmm. say, hey, Pilar, do you mind if we interview you? And I, you know, I get like like yourself, I get interview requests all the time. I was like, sure. So they interviewed me and they posted it, but then they also posted it on their Twitter. And what I didn't realize is that their Twitter, they have like 90,000 followers. Oh wow. And I was like, so not only did they post the picture, they posted the interview and they also posted like one of my drawings. Next thing you know, my Twitter, like my friend of mine texted me and says, hey, superstar, what's up with your Twitter? I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> this is your Twitter is like blown up. I was like, what? I opened it up and I had 300 followers. Like I would post something, which I appreciate every single one of those followers. I'm not saying 300 followers is bad. It's beautiful. Yeah. But, and I had appreciation for each and every one of those followers. But, but I would post something and get crickets like, you know, mm -hmm. but for some reason I looked down and it was like, it was like a, um, like a, a Wall Street Rolodex. ticker for the whole rest yeah. of like three days straight. It went, it shot up and I suddenly had like 5,000 followers. And then I found a photograph of myself. I said, okay, you know, I want to just post like one drawing every, at least a day or every other day or every few days, because I want to give, like five thousand of my five thousand of my closest friends now, I yeah. want to give them something like they're following me. So and now, so that's become sort of my quote job. Like I've been and I've turned it into a flat a platform. But I posted a photograph of myself just sitting at my desk. Like someone snapped the photograph. Like this is me sitting at my desk being goofy, and this is <laughs> back in like nineteen ninety nine, and it got twenty thousand likes. Yeah, like in a day. I was like, how is it, the, the algorithm's crazy. So Twitter has been like, and I was actually really close to deleting my Twitter account. Mm -hmm. Cause I was like, well, I'm pretty happy with my Instagram account and um, I have Instagram and LinkedIn. I don't want to uh, like thin out. I don't want to uh, dilute my online presence too much. I don't have that many followers on Twitter anyway. I'm just going to end my account. And I'm kind of glad I held on to it. <laughs> <laughs> was pretty awesome like jorge rodriguez who does like tigro um mm -hmm. you know the the uh like he he retweeted one of my drawings and followed me and 
and like I got a bunch of followers from that and I'm like he now he like likes my posts and I'm like I'm like Twitter friends with Jorge Rodriguez I'm a huge fan of his pretty amazing ain't it fucking wild how big yet how small this world really is it's crazy are are you on are you on to no that's how that's how we doy 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 sorry yeah. that's how we met that's how we met. <laughs> and, and and if yeah, you yeah. take a look it's like for instance, now I have a new thing I do where I'm posting. I have a, like an obscene amount of like Nickelodeon toys. Mm -hmm. And I've started, I, I, I was like, I think I'm going to also not only post my drawings, but I'm going to post my toys. And I got like a really cool response that it's just fun to have. Like I did this like stupid little doodle that I posted the other day. It got like 500 likes. And it's a doodle that was like basically sitting in a shoebox for 20 years. And now this drawing sees the light of day and that makes me feel good. Like these drawings are like living, breathing things that have been sitting waiting for their moments. <laughs> oh, they really have. And everything is coming back around now. It, it's this, <clears throat> this, this has come up in the last couple chats, but it's like nostalgia. Like p some people look at it negatively. Some people look at it positively. It just depends on, on your perspective of the whole thing. The same way people look at fan service, right? People, shit on fan service but people want fan service like me as a fan of anything I, I want more of it obviously right you know you don't want to, you don't want so much where you're like fuck why won't this show go away or why won't this movie or this book go away you want it everything ha has an expiration date essentially right but it, it's with these cartoons that you helped create with john and then you go over and you start doing the books with rocket power rocket power is a show in my opinion that does not get enough love there's there's shows out there especially for Nickelodeon. And I can think of three that that don't ever get the amount of love, especially whenever you see uh, a 20 year, a 30 year reunion, or when they do that whole huge splash page of 30 years of Nickelodeon. that has got all these cartoons, Angry Beavers. I love it. And a lot of them are on my wall. Angry Beavers never gets brought up enough. Rocket Power never gets brought up enough. So and the other one that, that, it's got a it's got an outstanding fan base and I you can draw the correlation between Z, uh it's Invader Zim is what I'm getting at. Invader Zim and Curse the Cowardly Dog. Uh, there's a lot of crossover from there. It's got some weird shit on both sides, but yeah. it's it's this lovable endearing characters. It's beautifully drawn. It's this pop of color, it's this pop of humor, you know. And, and it's it's a show, those three shows in my opinion are Nickelodeon's Dark Horses. They never get brought up. You see things like in Hot Topic and Spencers and you'll see like socks and lanyards and stuff like that. But Nickelodeon is sitting on a gold mine, in my opinion. There's so many people that are fiending, literally fiending for those cartoons on both yeah. Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon, you know, and if they would just put a little bit of effort behind it. So that's why whenever you you're you're amazed at like this little this little fucking post-it note that I drew 20 years ago, I was just doodling some I was just John was doing something funny. So I doodled him doing something funny and I did it in a cartoony way. It's like that was a snapshot of something that was going on during the production of Courage the Cowardly Dog or during the production of Rocket Power when you were doing those books or input any show you're at. So people, like I said, people get to see the, another piece of their childhood that they won't get to see anywhere else. Like if it wouldn't be for social media, if it wouldn't be for the Internet, you're not going to be able to see these little mm -hmm. drawings, these little videos, these little snapshots, these little Polaroids of you 20, 30 years ago. I mean, well, I'm, I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to share because I get like, um, I'm looking at it like, oh, I'm getting likes so I can monetize now. And I'm not interested. I'm going to tell you a really sad story. Um, it was a really cool Instagram feed. I'm not going to tell you the name because I don't want people to think that I'm um, shaming it, them. But they had, um, it was this wonderful Instagram feed about rock history. Mm hmm and um and they would post like videos and or, or really historical photos of, of like rock like and with facts about it like this is Jimi hendrix at his uh monterey concert or this is the first time that paul mccartney played on a tv show like and he has all these amazing photos and mm -hmm. and he a massive following and and little by little, he started recently, and I started following him, and I just love it because I'm also like a fan. I love classic rock. But le recently, he posted that he's been fought, coming across like hard times. Mm -hmm. And he start, and he has like a million followers. And he came across hard times, and he's like, um, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to start monetizing uh, no. ads. 
So I'm going to have to start accepting certain forms of ads or posting on behalf of certain people, certain, like, I guess maybe there's a way that if someone could pay you, if you have a certain number of followers, someone might be like, oh, I'm going to pay you. And, and could you post this for video that I made and stuff? Yeah. But little by little, his whole feed became about like 18 year old girls, like mm. getting doing in, in a very inappropriate things. And, and I'm like, wait, what, what, why are you posting that? And then there's another one about like some chick, like she, some other woman who is an adult, but she's practically naked and wiping, yeah. doing the laundry. And, and it's like, this is how she does the laundry. It's like, and every, each time it's like, why are you posting porn? And why are you po posting yeah. inappropriate porn? Especially like pe about people that are 18. Is this what happened to you? Like you, is this what happens when you get a million followers or you come across hard times and then these like internet creeps that are, that are opportunistic come in. That's why I'm like, I hope I never get him. Anyway, I'm, I'm really, I tried to hang in for this mm -hmm. account, but like the last straw was yet another, like a naked woman post. He might have sold the account. Uh, I know a lot of people do that. And a lot of people, you know, you'll see things start out as meme pages and then slowly they start to transition into something else because they amass this huge following off of something like comedy. And then it ends up changing. And a lot of the times it's a uh, bot farms too. Oh, that's cool. Well, it's really sad because a lot of people on the page got to know the, the person. Yeah. The original person. Yeah, and then everybody's like, hey man, are you okay? Where are you? Are you still in there? Mm -hmm. And um and I haven't been following as long as some people, but it made me really sad. And yeah. if, if you promise not to share it, I'll show it to you, I'll tell you what it is later and you can tell me what you think. And the only reason I don't want to share it is because I don't want people to think that I'm shaming this guy because maybe who knows? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Maybe he's trying to get a life-saving surgery and we don't know his situation, but I, what was my whole point? I'm so happy to have 5,000 followers, but I really hope that yeah. if somebody comes up to me and says, will you monetize or will you allow ads or like, I'm never, ever going to, I'm never, I'm, I refuse to do a threads, mm -hmm. one of those threads accounts on Instagram. Yeah, it's the Instagram um, version of Twitter. Yeah. I mean, I already have Twitter, you know. I'm not going to allow ads. I don't want to do anything different. Oh, because yeah. that's when things get messed up. I feel honored to have been a part of it. I was on an amazing team. Like, mm -hmm. and I only worked on one season, but I feel like that was a really memorable season. And I feel like season one, like, um, like was really like we were setting the tone. Yeah. You guys and did I feel like set a hell of a tone. Oh, it was really like talk about like bugs, like for instance, like Cats Motel. Like I was drawing spiders for <laughs> two weeks. Ugh. God, fuck, I hate those things. God, man, that. Oh, I was had to. I I had I worked on a lot of them. Like it was like, I was like, I have to work on spiders. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> and that was actually the very first episode I worked on. Yeah, they sat me down and was like, okay, working on this episode, you know. And that was the first episode and I started to learn how like prop design works and everything, you know, and it was, it was amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. So, you know, what I figure we can do, cause I, I know we, we could talk for hours, but it's already 10, 15, 10, 30. So I don't want to keep you too much longer, but there's one question that I always like to ask whenever we go to wrap up. And uh, if you had fun, I'd love to have you come back on. I know we talked about the uh, Curse of Cowardly Dog reunion. We're going to set that one up where you can be a part of it as well. Um, sure. I'd I would love, love to that have you anytime. On Absolutely. I Thank really you, man. I appreciate that. You. Thank you. I enjoyed it uh, as well. But uh, if you could summarize your your experience on Curse the Cowardly Dog, one word, one phrase, one sentence, one paragraph, or if there's an emotion that comes up when you think about working on Curse the Cowardly Dog, what comes to mind when you think about courage? Wow. Wow. Just wacky. Yeah. Because it was like, it was like just crazy, not only just in a good way. Because yeah. not only uh, was it like wacky, just the stuff we drew, mm -hmm. like everything from like Freaky Fred to <laughs> like, like, um, like I designed all the sh all the stages of him being fa uh, shaved. Yeah, 
Because when you're a prop designer, you also design, uh, you do character dress ups, like you'll do like costume. And courage is being um, shaved. Mm -hmm. uh, so all the different stages, right down to him being totally buck naked with like pink, Patches. like sweat yeah. colored. <laughs> uh, like <laughs> wacky stuff like that. But then also, like as artists, you had to have like a thick skin to work on the work in animation in the 90s, man, because like in a fun way, because you make fun of each other so much. Mm -hmm. Like I would come in and there would be like a crazy drawing of me on my desk, like the most insulting drawing, you know, like, and I was usually drawn like a demented Betty Boop, like in a straight jacket. <laughs> I actually have a folder this thick. Jesus. Of, like, drawings and i was just like jesus christ and then i would come in and i would do a rebuttal drawing and like it just <laughs> and then um who was your arch nemesis <laughs> in the drawings what happened who was your arch nemesis in the drawings like who would you go drawing for drawing with oh god like either the great martin wittig because yeah. he would come up with the craziest stuff like all i had to do was say like hi um hi samantha like uh, good morning. How are you? And Martin would be like, oh, the way Polaris said good morning. And he would quickly do a drawing. And like a minute later, there would be like some crazy drawing. Like all I said was good morning. But he would find humor in everything. Like, um, and um, and then I would be like, oh my God. Well, oh yeah, well. And then I would draw something like, oh yeah, well, you know. <laughs> it was crazy. I can't even like put it into words, but. It was so fun, but it was <laughs> harmless at the same time because we yeah. would just like join each other, you know? <laughs> and so like the humor was so fun. Like we would have full on like paper battles, like mm -hmm. uh, paper ball battles. Like um, Tim Chi Lee, the design supervisor, like he'd come in and he'd be like, hey, Paul Hart, blah, 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 blah. And he'd like <laughs> throw like a bunch of paper balls at me. And then I'd be like, oh yeah. Oh. And I would like sneak attack him so one time he got me so bad i got so mad i took an entire garbage bag and sat there garbage can and filled it with balled up paper and i went over and like dumped it on him and the fact that like i took the time to do that he was like god and then <laughs> um he at one point he went over to the um i can't remember if i did this to him or if he did this to me he probably did this to me like i got on the elevator to go to lunch and we're on the 11th floor and he ran over to the elevator and went, da, 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 da. he pressed all the <laughs> buttons and ran out. I was like, damn. And you can hear my voice going, damn you, damn. as the door closes. And I'm like, no. <laughs> like, we just had so much fun on that show. Like, it's just like insane. Insane's the other word. <laughs> well, that sound that sounds like a blast. Like I said, uh, this has been a this has been a real treat getting to chat with you for the last hour and change. Um, but before we wrap up, I, I know you had, you had mentioned a couple things that you're working on now, and I know the fans would love to know what is Pilar doing now. And I know you said you were working on an independent uh, independent film. You had the uh, Don't Slow Down. Was that the was that the independent film that you were working on? Yeah, well, Don't Slow Down is the independent film that I'm in the midst of working on now. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a metaphor. So what happened was a few years ago, like a 10 years ago, I had this really bizarre dream. I woke up in the middle of the night, which is what I do when I have dreams. I really remember extremely vividly. I, I wrote down a few notes, did a sketch, went back to sleep and forgot about it. And then like uh, then uh, a few years later, I every now and then I would revisit my sketchbook and do like a few notes. And then I would forget about it. And a couple of years later, I would do a few more notes. Like, oh, this is kind of a cool idea. So, um, and then I just forgot about it. Finally, when the pandemic happened, uh, suddenly after the pandemic, well, some say that it's still happening because, you know, yeah. but I'm saying like, it, it's better. <laughs> but um, it felt like a story I wanted to tell because it was a metaphor for what happens when you stop. When you stop mm -hmm. moving, something bad happens. So, yeah. and it's like, I don't want to give too much away, but it's like, you're witnessing the the end of a civilization. Mm -hmm. And it's one character that has to keep moving because whenever he stops, something bad happens. And if you don't keep moving again, you eventually die. Yeah. Which he eventually, spoiler, which he eventually does. 
And then it's the end. Um, he's the very, very last of his kind. Mm -hmm. And it's the beginning of a new civilization that was built on the old civilization. Very cheerful. <laughs> it, it sounds really cool, though. It's really it's really funny because all of my story ideas are actually really dark, even though like people think like everything I do is very like, you know, I, I labor and say, oh, Pilar, you're so bubbly, you're so cheerful. But like all of my story ideas are super dark. Like mm -hmm. I want to do uh, a music video about uh, funeral practices and mm -hmm. Victorian postmortem photography that fascinates the crap out of me. But. Anyway, the reason that this story felt important for me, slow down, don't slow down, was um, during the pandemic, I have so many friends, so many people I know, or even colleagues or or, or acquaintances that um, were completely healthy. But then the pandemic happened and then after a year of like isolating or a year of like not moving around as much, I had like perfectly healthy uh, people I knew like get sick and some even died mm -hmm. and and I was like this is crazy and this brought me even further back to a few years ago like I'm in touch with all of my um teachers like they're little by little like getting like older and you know um some of them have even like a couple of them have even like passed on and but um one of them my uh my uh teacher Miss Dell who was like my second my sophomore year, like watercolor teacher. I'm still very good friends with her. She said, never retire, Pilar. I was like, what do you mean by that? She said, never retire. I said, why? She said, because the second you retire and stop moving, that's when you get sick. Mm. And she was referring to like someone she knew, you know? And I was like, and that's stuck in my head. And then when the pandemic happened and suddenly everyone I knew was suddenly like isolating in place and, I had a few, I knew a few people that didn't even leave their apartment for two years, uh, more than one wow. person. So, so for some reason, I'm not trying to tell a story. It's not about the pandemic. It's a metaphor and it's very abstract the way I tell it, but mm -hmm. it felt like now's the time to tell this story. Yeah. And, uh, and it's also like, but it's also like abstract. It's not like, this is what happens. You know, it's like, there's no dialogue. It's very abstract. It's very like, post-apocalyptic uh so it's really cool it's like nothing i've ever done before and i can't wait to get it out there um do you have an idea of when it might be done i'm aiming for early fall okay and um but i'm making um good progress um things got really hectic with you know with my teaching and and i just recently became program director of our my department of program director of the uh, design and digital uh, multimedia uh, department at, at the City College of New York. And um, things got really like busy. So I haven't really been able to like, well, for the last month, been able to really touch my film. But now that summer is here, I'm going to uh, really just hit the ground running. So I'm excited about that. And then there's another film called Last Class, mm -hmm. which I'm really um, excited about that I finished. Um, I finished up last fall. And it's been doing the making the festival rounds, <laughs> excuse me. And it's gotten into um, a bunch of festivals, um, most notably, or uh, one of the most notably, I mean, because I love all the festivals I got into, is um, uh, Monstra Fest in Lisbon, Portugal. So, hmm. and I actually went and it's like a wonderful festival. Like, uh, and so like the, but this film is about, it's a two minute little mini doc about, the exact moment that I found out we were going into lockdown yeah. and I happened to be in front of my class. And um, I was literally just standing in front of my class when someone came in and said, you're going into lockdown. This is the last time you will be on campus for the rest of the semester. And it, I was like, what? So, um, and the crazy thing is here's the eerie thing that I was going to tell you is I, I teach animation. I never record my class. When we started teaching in Zoom, I would record my class. But in person, I never recorded my class. But for some reason, this particular day, I pressed record on the memo app on my phone. And mm -hmm. I just decided to record my the, the audio of my class because I thought it would be helpful for the students to have the step-by-step -step audio because I was teaching them a software. Mm -hmm. 
but for some weird reason, I don't know why I chose to re record this particular class, but I did the lesson and then I taught and then somebody came in and said, you're, you know, finish your class, you're going home. And, 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 and I turned around because my, my students hadn't heard um, them say that. And I turned around and they were just sitting together in the same space, in the same room working. I snapped a picture of my class because I was like, this is the last moment of normalcy they'll ever know, at least for the foreseeable future. And then someone else came in and said it louder. They heard. And then I was like, I finished up the lesson and I said, okay, we're going home. Listen out for instructions. And this was during a time where like, ah, they're probably wrong. We'll probably be back next week. You know, a lot of times. Like, yeah. It was like, yeah, for years, like it was crazy. So anyway, and it was only, it's like two minutes, no, two minutes and 30 seconds, but I've shown it to people, my, my film last class. And people have had like visceral responses to it. Like a lot of people mm -hmm. that I showed to cried. I was like, I was like, really? Like, I was like, and it really just started as a challenge to myself. Like, could I animate something in under a month? Because I was like, I want to, I'm tired of all my ideas being so complicated. I want to come up yeah. with something where I kind of could challenge myself. Can I make a film in a month? You know, it actually took a little longer than a month, but like, you know, I'm proud of how it came out. <laughs> As as you should be, I can't wait for uh, I can't wait for it to finish the the film circuit so we can see it on on YouTube or if you're going to put it up on a website or something like that, and then the fans can sit there and throw some throw some money towards it and see it, man. Um, oh, that so that time, you know, it's four years ago, right? Um, I I was in a kitchen when that happened. My sh I I fucking remember it so vividly, right? He's like, hey, get the sanitizer buckets. Really, really wipe stuff down every time you do something. We weren't even, no, no masks, no nothing. We weren't even talking about lockdown. And then we finished a lunch service and uh, they get the call saying, hey, Disney's closing the parks. We had friends at Disney World. Like, get the fuck out. Disney isn't closing parks. Like, no, no, no. Like, I, I'm on I'm on the phone with the executive chef over at whatever whatever restaurant or whatever resort. They're literally telling people to get out of the parks now. And they, I was like, well, what are we doing? They're like, uh, go home. We'll uh, – they put us all on a, on a text thread. Um, you know, they put us all on uh, – like, we would all FaceTime, like, every couple of days. Um, you know, some people would get on the FaceTime. Some people wouldn't, you know. We just thought it was a two week two week to curb the spread or whatever yeah. it was, and then everything was going to go back to normal. And here we are, four year late, four years later, and it's. I mean, it, I lived in Florida, so it was a lot more normal than most places were, um, you know. But it was still that that first first couple of days was fucking wild. And then you go to the store for the yeah. first time, and people are hoarding toilet paper and hoarding yeah. pieces of I water. Like crazy. the the craziest thing, and and we'll we'll uh, we'll end it right after this, uh, and then. The craziest thing I saw, um, um, personally, I went to a Walmart, right? And you see some crazy shit at Walmart. All you got to do oh, is yeah, go to yeah. people Already, at walmart.com. Yeah. yeah, you know what I mean? So, but it There's was like a whole the, like Insta just about that. Yeah, people of walmart.com, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And I, I I, saw, you ever seen Breaking Bad? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I already know of it. I've seen like five episodes, yeah. So there's a very famous scene that almost everybody knows whether you've seen the show or not, but it's it's Walter White and it's Jesse Pinkman, the two main characters, and then their yellow hazmat suits. The yellow hazmat suit. I know exactly what you were going to say. Yep. Yeah. I, I saw a guy in a yellow hazmat suit, but that wasn't even the wildest thing. The wildest thing I saw, I am a huge fan since I did since I did a little bit of time in the, in the Navy. I'm a huge fan of naval history, especially World War II. I, I love that era. I love reading about that era. You know, it's fascinating. I saw a dude in a legitimate fucking full military fatigues but he was wearing a whether it was a fucking world war ii a cold cold war era uh you know vietnam i i don't know but it was full-on gas mask respirator yeah. everything he had the hose like he legitimately looked like he was uh, a fucking stormtrooper from star wars he was just hooked up yeah I've, I've seen i've seen photographs of that those yeah those yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's terrifying you're just trying to get some fucking food and some water for your family, and you see that motherfucker walking through carrying a box of Swiss rolls and cosmic brownies. I'm like, Jesus Christ, I'm in the wrong spot. Yeah. Oh my God. Ah, uh, so. I'm so like, I'm knocking on wood. 
and so mm. happy that like things are like you know starting to get back to normal front gotten no- yeah like it's like what and i and i've yeah. actually had covid twice and both times it felt like a bad cold like because it mm-hmm. by the time it got to me it had gotten to the point where it wasn't that Mm-hmm. And, like it did it still sucked a little but it like it felt like a bad cold but i was still careful and like isolated and all that stuff but anyway yeah. well everyone be healthy out there <laughs> absolutely well uh like i said this has been a lot of fun where can the fans go and find you if they want to say hey pilar i like the stuff you do where are you at on instagram and twitter what's your handle yeah i'm just i'm at pilar tunes for both and here i'll put it in the chat um i mean not that i don't know if people like See, but it says P I L A R T O O N S. It's my name plus tunes. Get it? Rhymes with cartoons. Oh. <laughs> but I'm at Pilar Tunes on on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, I'm also at Pilar Tunes on Facebook and um and Tumblr. But I have about like, you know, I have like four followers on Tumblr, and I don't even does Tumblr even exist anymore. Uh, sometimes it does. Every once in a while, you get a crack at it. Yeah, I have. Matter of fact, fun fact that um, you know the post I'm talking about, right? Where I'm drawing on the blackboard. Mm-hmm. Um, that's from Tumblr. Oh wow! And it was from a user, a really cool gal. Her name is the Unknown Dimensions. Mm. So that that's the username. Um, but that that's actually from Tumblr. People associate it with like Twitter. It's like no, it's Tumblr. Oh, excuse me. It's called X now. <laughs> <laughs> I I still call it Twitter. Oh, absolutely. I do too. And he, it's a tweet. It's a tweet. I don't know what they call it with X now, but uh, all of those, uh, all of your, your handles will be in the show notes below. So people can just point, click and go to it. They don't have to type in anything and it'll go right to, right yeah. to your uh, Twitter and your Instagram. Like, well, I'm, uh, easy. I'm just at Pilar tunes for everything, especially Twitter and Instagram. So, yeah. Absolutely. Make it easy for them so they don't have to second guess it. Well, she's been Pilar. I've been Julian. It's been What's My Head Podcast. And this has been another piece and a huge piece of your childhood. Good night.